out of this. Greetings, I am Shad, and in this video we get to revisit one of my favourite topics, that being the back scabbard, and more specifically, why it wasn't used more often in the past when swords are actually employed you know, for, for self-defense and all that stuff. Now, the reason why we're actually uh, coming back to this topic is that it's, it's been brought back into interest because it's, it's a topic that uh, will be very hard to ever uh, be done with it because we're always exploring different ideas, ways where it's possible, and also perhaps uncovering new points of evidence as to why or why not. And I know for myself, I've more recently done a lot of research on this topic to try and find out some more information that uh, I'm going to be sharing with you. And and so uh, recently, there's this brilliant new YouTuber who's just, you know, he's in our sword community and is making content. His name is Nate V, and uh, his YouTube channel is called Nate V or Sword Savvy because on his banner it's Sword Savvy. And he made a video on backscabbers showing that there's another way in which it can be executed where you don't actually need a, uh, you know, specially made backscabbard like I have here, which is really brilliant. And that, of course, has created the discussion once again. So you really should go subscribe to Nate's YouTube channel, it's brilliant, and I'm going to be testing out his method of uh, drawing a sword from your back, as well as a couple of others, two specifically, that might have more historical validity. There is already historical validity to, uh, you know, wearing a sword on your back, but in the medieval period, that's where we actually find a very, like, a large lack of evidence. So not only is this one of my favourite topics because I like the look of having a sword on your back, but I also find legitimate functional uh, advantages with wearing it this way. And I've made a whole video exploring that. In fact, it is, to yeah, right now, don't know what will happen in the future, but it's my most popular video to date with over 4 million views. And like I said in that video, I explore the pros and cons and the big feature is that I introduce and demonstrate my back scabbard. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it is working just as well as, uh, as ever. I uh, like <laughs> really, really brilliant. So yeah, it works, of course it still works, and it is that detail that makes this a really intriguing subject for me because it does work, okay, uh, that's been proven in multiple different ways, but because there are also legitimate advantages to it, and I actually mean that, I really do find that there are, and it raises the question as to why wasn't this done more prominently in the past, because if it works, why not? Okay, and it's a really great question. That's the main thing we're going to explore, like I said. But before we dive into that, I do want to just quickly go over some of the advantages of having a sword on your back versus having your sword on the side. The biggest one for me is running, but specifically running with having your hands free, because you can absolutely run with a sword on your side, but it will flap around. Okay, and uh, just to kind of show you what I mean, yes. So when you're running, you see this? It's uh, it's jumping, it's flipping, and uh, it's just. It's just not the best thing, is it? so you instinctively want to hold it. Now, there are strapping methods that hold a sword even more securely, and uh, it would flap around less because of that, but it still will flap around, especially jumping up and down. Now, like I said, the way to fix that is to hold it, but that removes one of your hands. So the most secure way of wearing a sword is having it fixed in two locations. If it's only fixed at one point, well, that's a pivot point and it'll flap around. And so that's why on most sword, you know, um, hanging systems, there'll be two points that help secure it, especially if the second point is wrapping around the back like that, you know, it's a wrap like that, it holds it, but not perfectly, okay? It'll still flap around as a result. And so a far more secure way of uh, connecting the scabbard to your body is uh, separating the points of contact and keeping them very close. And that's exactly what we see on the back scabbard. You have the bottom connection point and the top connection point, and so that keeps it really, really secure. Now, in my first video, I had it looping around my bottom belt, but you know, <laughs> big brain moment has been done by so many other people is a third strap right here. This additional belt here prevents it from sliding down because uh, to slide down, this part of the belt needs to slide up, but that's being held down and that is connected right down here. And so as a result, this is <laughs> even more secure. It stops sliding down. It doesn't force my blower belt to hang up and then it is there ready to go. And uh, then just show Right back there, like that. So with that, <laughs> this is actually fixed way more secure. Like, 
I can't, like, you can, I can jump up and down, I can run around, and I actually have a video of me doing cartwheels, um, really putting that to the test. So go check out that video as well. I'm not going to bother doing cartwheels right now, because the cartwheel was the point of bringing, like, when you were actually upside down pulling up, yeah, you did need, like, a strap just to hold it in. But what I will show you, and this is an idea that some people have assumed, and it really depends on the type of scabbard, that when you bend over, it'll fall out. Well, it's, it's 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 not falling out, okay? <laughs> like it is really good and snug and secure there. If I can I get it, there we go. So you really need to jerk it to get it to slide out. But when it's in there like that, normal movement like this, secure, not a problem. And then when you need it, very quick. Very easy, just like that. So that is by far the main benefit, but it's actually an interesting point of reference to look back on to try and find the answers to why that it wasn't done historically. So remember that, okay? Best, biggest advantage is how securely it is fixed to your body, and then we'll be coming back to that point a bit later on. So there are a couple of tangential comparisons that, you know, should be made trying to determine the pros and cons, but a lot of these ones I personally find that they're the differences are so minor that it wouldn't matter either way. For instance, uh, comfort. Yeah, it's a weight on your shoulder. This is a weight on your side. Like, you know, personal preference I think would come in there. Um, what is generally better to have things hang on your hips or your shoulders? Both can support lots of weight. So again, no real massive, you know, one way or the other. Speed of drawing. Now this is one that I actually found can be a bit of a misconception that uh, because you need to move your arm over a larger distance to grab your sword, that therefore it's going to be slower to draw there. Just in testing this, I find that it's actually almost so close, you can't even really see a difference. Because one of the other things is that it only applies to my type of scabbard, where I actually don't need to draw it out as far right, of that sheath, as I do need it here. To get the sword out of, you know, a, sh a normal sheath, you need to draw it the full length of the blade uh, to get it out, especially when you got a big, long one like mine. But with this one, you only need to draw it, you know, half the length of the blade, and it's good to go out. And so the actual time it takes to get it out of the sheath is far, far less than right there. I generally don't like these because there is bias involved in everything, but I'll just I'll legitimately try and draw it, you know, these swords as fast as I can, all right? So hands at the side and everything. If I go there, bleh. all right. Now, I actually think I probably could do faster because the sword is a little stuck in the sheath, which uh, this one tends to do. But I tell you what, in terms of a speed comparison of putting it back quicker, <laughs> actually I'm putting the sword back in the sheath longer on the side than on the back because it's very intuitive but it doesn't really matter because putting the sword away isn't nearly as crucial as getting the sword out so now uh oh, gee it does stick so now it's a little loose I really don't want bias I'm trying to be as fast as I can so so that's that and then if I was just standing still it's hard to tell which one was faster I actually think the back scabbard might have been uh, slightly faster. You could, I tell you, you know, getting better at putting it back, you can feel when the blade is snug. I get a sound cue and a tactile kind of cue to know, ah, that's in, bang. And, uh, and remember in my other video where I was having trouble and I said, practice will make perfect. Had a lot of practice now, putting it back, easy as anything. So again, hands at the side, even if, one is quicker than the other. And just from my own understanding and, you know, brain time measurement there, I actually think the back scout is a tiny bit faster. But honestly, the difference is so minute, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So no real pro or con there either. There is a very big con to the back scabbard versus the side scabbard. And this might be one of the more significant reasons, even though I'm jumping the gun because I still want to explore Nate V's method of doing this uh, and then get to the reasons why it wasn't done historically. But I guess we're going to get one of those reasons before because it is a big pro and con. And that is cloaks. Right? Uh, people probably don't understand how prominent and common cloaks were in the medieval period. They were used for warmth, keeping off the rain, fashion. They were very common, okay, for a lot of people. Not everyone, of course, but for a lot of people. If you're going outside, you'll be wearing a cloak. 
Yeah. Uh, I have a whole video exploring, you know, employing cloaks in combat and the differences, and I get this thing out and do some tests. And there might be some workarounds, but overall, very difficult to wear a cloak and incorporate such a back scabbard straight away. And so that's the issue. The answer is, of course, don't wear a cloak. Do you always need to? No, you don't always need to. But in the times where you do, you could get it over, it would be awkward, and so it's not to say it makes it impossible. It's not like, well, because it's more difficult to wear a cloak. It's not impossible, I shouldn't say it's impossible, but because it's more difficult, backscab is a complete, no, no. And what's interesting is cloaks in fantasy sometimes are used a lot, but not in like when it's visually depicted. Cloaks aren't very common in terms of the action. Like you don't see the witcher wearing a cloak because when you really want to jump and flip around, well, I think a cloak could get in the way more than a backscab. So, general consensus is you take it off. But again, I've got a whole video on if you really need to take a cloak off in combat and pros and cons. So next pro and con, I actually think this is a really big point in the back scabbard's favor over the side scabbard. And that is not only, so we've already done running and jumping, but when you need to climb or crawl on the ground or wade through uh, water of some kind, if you're in a swamp or things like that, and like war, like whole battles were waged in conditions in swamps and stuff like, there was some battles in Ireland and it's when they're, they are, uh, uh, war dart was used a lot and there's actually pictures of you know noblemen and people who fought in those wars without shoes on to reflect the fact that you know they fought in these wars in marshes and they didn't wear shoes because <laughs> so they'd get waterlogged stuck in the ground and other things so they just went barefoot uh, so absolutely and if you're doing that you would want to keep the sword out of the water or marsh. You could do it and your sword would just get wet. You would want to clean it very quickly and if it was already pre-oiled, you could actually protect it. It depends how long. It's not ideal. And if you wanted to avoid issues like that, having the sword in your back, solves it completely unless it's really high. Sneaking, perhaps it's a slight pro in the backscabbard's favor. Uh, because this one can swing around more, higher chance of it hitting something. Because people say that, you know, this is gonna hit uh, things when you're walking around. In my experience from having worn both, it's uh, about the same, honestly. That, like, there's a very high chance that this hits. I have had this hit things on the side and some, I, like, I just need to be a little mindful and careful. As you do with the sword on the side, so maybe that's even, honestly. So next advantage, and I think this one might be more significant than people realize. We talk about uh, wearing the sword, but when you draw one of these swords, well, you're still going to be wearing the sheath. Now, what's interesting is that most methods of attaching a scabbard or sheath to your belt is made to balance it when a sword is in. And so for some, not all of them, but for some, when you draw the sword out, this becomes unbalanced completely and it will flap down and just hang like that. And it actually becomes less secure and will swing around even more. And so that's a detrimental thing with, uh, with a side scabbard. But back scabbard, when the sword is out, <laughs> like this is in a very secure spot. So not a problem either. Uh, let's get that in there. Now I've mentioned this last one briefly already, but I actually want to kind of emphasize a little bit more is putting the sword away. Now, I cannot put this sword away in its sheath one-handed without looking at the scabbard. It flips around too much. I have no point of reference. I simply can't do it. You would think intuitively it would be impossible, perhaps even harder on your back, but this is where my own design has a big advantage and makes it a different game. As I mentioned, does that really matter? Because once it's, you know, uh, if the fighting is done, you can just look at it, put it away two-handed, take your attention off. But what if you actually needed to change weapons and you didn't want to throw your weapon away and you're in combat and you need to do it quickly? But say you're in a fight where you grab your sword out, you're doing your thing and you just need to quickly change your weapons or grab something or you need two hands it quickly. Maybe you're in a grab, well, if someone's grappling you, you probably wouldn't take the time, but you just needed a, there could be a reason, all right? Multiple reasons even, where you just needed to put the sword away quickly one-handed and then do what you need to do and then uh, you can grab it out again. And so <laughs> putting the sword away, all right, with this uh, back scabbard is actually a lot easier <laughs> than that. And, uh, and so I think the proof of concept has been proven a lot. Uh, at so that's one, it isn't a game changer. And ultimately for nowadays, especially in fantasy, it's gonna be a bit of personal preference. What you want for your character either, and if you're actually wearing a sword, what you prefer. If you're going to be reflecting something historical, still like in the medieval period, we're gonna to get to that. I'm gonna explore the prevalency, 
and perhaps reasons why. But now I want to explore some of these other methods, starting off with Nate's one. So with Nate's method, and I don't think he's the first one to propose or come up with this idea. I'm not saying he copied anyone else. It's just that when you're thinking of a problem, it's very intuitive to actually come to the same ideas. And that's the same with my back scabbard. I'm not the first person to think of putting a opening on the side of a scabbard and open it up. I didn't copy anyone, but I came to that same idea just by looking at the issue logically. Though I've never seen anyone add the guiding flap wing uh, of the backstabber to help put it back in. And uh, I think I've demonstrated again and again and again. It works beautifully. In fact, it was working better than when I first started because I had less practice. But once you get the practice down, this thing, the guiding flap, works beautifully in putting the sword away. So I think I could credit that to being my own invention. I still came up with the opening myself, but I'm saying, like, perhaps no one else has figured it out before. I, I don't know, I just haven't seen it, and it does work. So conventionally, when people are saying you can't draw a sword that's on your back, they are always referring to drawing it on the same side as your main hand using it. And of course, you run into a classic problem. Your arm reach isn't enough to bring it out, and so, People have just kind of said, that's the issue, there's no point in arguing any further, it can't be done, just wear it on your side. Now, even though that's not true, it can be done, Nate's shown it, and especially when you make a different scabbard, I've shown it, it actually does, I think, give insight as to perhaps why it wasn't done historically, because we've seen in real life that when there's such an easy alternative, just wearing it on your side, there's no real need to try and work out any solution. You just resort to that because it's, it's already there. You have a solution, bang. You don't need to try and play around with it. Smart people, right, have looked at this problem many times before and just simply says it can't be done. That is evidence to show that that's probably a big reason why people in the past just saw there's no point in trying to... Maybe it can be done, but why you can just wear it on your side and you're all good. As the saying goes, necessity is the mother of invention. It's only when you, you, there's a problem to be solved or you have a reason to really try and figure out to do something that you end up inventing or figuring out a method to do it. And the question is historically, was there a need? Not really. Think about that. I'm kind of meshing the latter part of this video with this now. I'm just kind of addressing reasons why historical medieval people probably didn't do this as we go, as they come up. And this is one that's come up. And it's that how often would a medieval soldier, knight, anyone who was wearing a sword, be first running, jumping, wading through marshes, things like that? The obvious answer is not very often. In actual fact, in many of the instances where they would be running, the sword is already going to be in their hand and drawn, and they might end up charging at the enemy. They don't always charge, by the way. And so even on the battlefield, running is something you do less than what is depicted in Hollywood and things like that. They will march, approach the enemy in an actual formation. Okay, but if they do charge there, if they retreat, you're probably running then. And if you're pursuing or retreating, but, you know, enemy, you'd be running as well. And in all those instances, you'd be holding it. And so you wouldn't really need to think about a better way of strapping or wearing a sword when it's sheathed that keeps it more secure when you're doing these active activities because you're just holding it when you're doing it. So again, no real necessity need, ergo, no reason why people need to go out of the way to do it. There is a, another obvious kind of thing as to might explain if people, not some wearing a sword on your back in, with the intent to draw it, but carrying it over long distances, that's where m many people have said, not just me, said, yeah, it makes sense to carry a sword in your back if you're traveling over long distances. Of course, someone must have done it historically. So now getting back to the method that Nate is proposing in his brilliant video, you really need to go watch it, check it out, okay? Instead of uh, having the hilt of the sword on the same side as the arm you're drawing it, he says, what about if the sword is here and you reach across your body and grab it like so, and then you draw it out like that because you have a longer draw. So now let's actually fix this to my back and test it. Now to give this method every chance of success, uh, I think you need to go out of your way and uh, look for a method of fixing it that will help out. So hanging it or attaching it to your back with straps that are meant to attach to your side, probably isn't gonna help out as much. And that might be very well be the way Nate is doing it, but if I'm gonna be doing it, instead of having it hanging off a belt where it's separated and can slide around things like that, I feel you'd actually want the, you know one belt coming up straight and then another belt coming down straight. And so it's on your back like that instead of hanging off a belt because that's gonna make more problems. And so I have this you know leather kind of frog thing that actually came with one of my kids' uh, wooden swords meant to hang a thing. And uh, I'm just made an attachment to slide this through like so. 
and it's gonna be too darn big. I did it with the long sword, and I'm trying it with this uh, arming sword, and it actually doesn't fit for the arming sword. But the thing is, Nate has shown it, okay? And so I wanted to reproduce it, duplicate it, and show you that it does work, all right? Depending on the size of the sword. And Nate points that out, and he says it does work for long swords, and yes, it does work for long swords, not the really long, long swords, depending on your arm length. But for like an arming sword, I already showed you that uh, on this side, problem. But on this side, not, not a problem at all. <laughs> like, you can absolutely draw it now. Um, it requires the, uh, the scabbard to flip up a little bit, but especially if it's a bit lower. And uh, in terms of people saying it's a danger, even Nate pointed out it might be a danger of cutting yourself here, the blade's pretty darn close to your side when you're drawing it there. It's just the face is more, it's close to your eyes, which is when it, what really triggers the alert kind of reaction. But it's no more closer, it's just dangerous. And you're careful and you can just draw it out. <laughs> I don't see that as an issue as well. Now, putting it back requires practice. Nate clearly practiced this a lot, but yeah, his method works. Perfectly fine. Length of sword though, that's where we get to the issue. I actually made this to fit my long sword, not the arming sword, so this will actually, oh, <laughs> let me uh, take off the side strap here. And now <laughs> we can put it in, right? So I've made it to uh, fit this, and uh, all right, so that's actually pretty secure. We've got a top strap, a uh, top belt, bottom belt, and we can fix it across. Now, Spoilers, I already mentioned that I ran into troubles doing it this way, but I'm still going to show you because it also demonstrates how securely it's fixed onto your back doing this method as well, which is worth showing. And so that's why I'm going to show you, and I can also show you one of the potential uh, difficulties. Strapping it this way works best when you have that third or second belt, whatever you want to call it, um, strapped on the side. So I have a you know a bit of a thong um, right there that uh, I can just wrap around here and get the effect there, and so that's going to be pretty secure. Now, in terms of comfort, now this is attached, um, it's actually it's actually pretty secure, okay? So, in terms of people saying it's flapping around too much, depends how it's fixed. It's always going to be depending on what your belt thing is. So, if this was hanging off like a side belt, I'd run into issues, but because I've attached it in a more secure method, like, this is actually really, really good. Like, surprisingly, when I'm running around, this is, like, secured really effectively and if I try and swing around it does flap. that's where the that's where it can get a bit oh, okay you know see, see, see this action here uh, but running it works now if you're going to be using arming sword bastard sword short or long sword Nate has shown it can work all right and uh, if it was tighter it would stop the sliding back but for me for this long sword too long so you watch what happens all right I can grab it All right, now Nate said for a long sword, get it onto the side of the shoulder. So I'm gonna try even that, like really bring it around, okay? Like that, really try and give this every chance, all right? Uh, drawing it from the side, like. <laughs> it was a stretch. You can do it, you can draw it. Okay, so Nate was right, absolutely. Um, putting it back. Oh, now it is close to my face, hey. Uh, he grabbed it, so let me double check that. Oh, practice. I don't want to discount something when all it takes is practice, but this is this is awkward to begin with. Um, oh, <laughs> I don't want to push that any further, but what I will do is do it the, the old, old comical way of, you know, trying to get a sword out. Okay, so... That is back in, secure right. So a couple of things that basically need to happen to get this to work. The belt's all coming loose now. <laughs> I, I didn't fix it as tight as I should have. So one of the things that really needs to happen to get Nate's method to work is that you can't fix the bottom part of the scabbard to the back. It needs to be able to slide up like this for you to pull it out. And that does cause it to flail, flail around, but it works, okay? It works for most swords. When you get into the really long ones, that, that's when you do run into trouble. I, even though I was able to pull this sword out, you know, getting it onto the back, onto my shoulder like this, it would affect the quick drawing thing. You'd have to reposition the sword to grab it and then pull it out. 
it can be done. <laughs> I'm trying right here. And when something can be done, with enough practice, you can get super fast. So I'm not gonna try and gauge the end result of how effective it is based on my current ability with it. But Nate has shown he has a lot of practice, especially putting it away. And so we're, depending on the type of sword, my conclusion is this is absolutely a perfectly valid method of wearing a sword on your back. So awesome, Nate. Thank you for sharing it with us and really looking forward to seeing what you make in the future. So if wearing a sword on your back can be done and there are functional reasons to do so, there are benefits to do so, and even situations in which individuals will prefer it. Like for me, I actually prefer it. Granted, some of it is biased because I do like the way it looks. And when it comes to, uh, you know, preferences in fashion, that is very culturally influenced. Uh, one of the reasons I'm, you know, I like it is probably very likely the fact that I've seen it in pop culture so much and it's just imprinted on my subconscious that that looks cool. It has this cool, strong thing. But even with that having, even with having said that, okay, uh, does not mean that there wouldn't have been someone in the past who would have liked that even against the cultural norms of the day. Just that most people honestly would have been affected by the cultural norms and this was the fashionable way to wear a sword as well as all the other functional reasons and that would have the most you know overriding you know influence as to where a sword would be worn. There is evidence of swords being worn on the back in the past. There are pictures from Japan, other places in Asia, China. Uh, there's also some interesting, Scarlagrim shared this one in his own video on the matter, is that um, there are certain, you know, Celtic graves of people buried with swords underneath them, on their back essentially. Now, he does mention that that isn't confirmation that they wore it, they were just buried this way, but there is a Celtic statue that looks like it has a sword depicted on the back as well. This idea, because there are functional reasons, and it is a practical method of doing it that we've shown, that means obviously it appears at some points in the past. Did it appear in the medieval period? I have found no evidence for it. When I say I have found, in the past couple of days, I'm not, I'm not I've literally scoured through thousands, thousands of pictures of medieval artwork going in areas, you know, where you can access them that aren't generally known by the public. Because I figure if there is an image of a, of a medieval artwork showing a sword on the back, if it appeared in any of the common sources, it would have appeared somewhere on the internet already. So I need to look at areas that probably haven't been you know, looked at as often. And what's really great about the modern day is a lot of museums are digitizing their illuminated manuscripts and other medieval artworks. So you can actually get access to huge amounts of this, you know, these medieval artworks that uh, are generally hard to find on the internet uh, and have only just been coming available. And just on a side note, like the, the days, well not days, but the hours, I think I've spent um, six to, six to nine hours or so just scouring the internet looking for artwork that might show you know swords on the back i found some really interesting images like just injury bizarre ones sometimes just interesting ones i found this great source that showed portraits of bavarian dukes that date from the early 1500s so this is just at the end of technically the official medieval period but it's right on the transitional period and it's just, it shows fashion, it shows style, and one of the things that drew me towards that, it, I was looking at towards the latter end of the medieval period where swords were bigger and there might be more functional reason to wear on your back, but even in these portraits where they're wearing big, at least long swords, and in one case, that looks like a great sword, right? So they're all on the side still. There were some maybe images, that something on his back, but, but ultimately no, there's nothing definitive. And, I, and so after looking through thousands of images, not a single sword on the back or indication of it being on the back really, you know, paints the picture. Now, absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. Okay, so just because we can't find it doesn't mean it was never done. But the more often it was done, the more likely it would have appeared in artwork like this because swords are depicted in artworks, quite in medieval artworks, quite a lot. And so the lack of depictions of swords on the back with medieval artwork at least gives an indication that it was very rare, okay? So why was that the case if there is functional reasons to do it? So I've been thinking about that and I've come to some interesting kind of conclusions because uh, the first first one we've already talked about, fashion and tradition, that's it. That's a far bigger one than you might think. And so once it's already established that this is the way that you wear a sword, people are going to wear a sword that way to fit in and the people wearing it the other way stand out. Sometimes people want to do that, but more often than not, you, you know, there's a reason why people don't wear underwear on their heads in the modern day. There's things have certain functional reasons and you wear them where they need to go. People do it sometimes, but 
for the large majority of people who just want to conform to what is generally understood as fashionable, of course. The question is, why was the fashion established then? Because when the first people started wearing swords, why was it picked to be on the side, then on the back, and then after that decision was made, tradition can come in and it becomes more ingrained. And there's actually a very big reason uh, that I, d I haven't heard anyone you know, mention that when I think about it, this could be a really significant reason as to that would exclude wearing a sword on your back in a lot of situations, battlefield warfare situations specifically. Now, it's not because medieval people were opposed to wearing things on their back. They did. But that actually might be the answer. They might not have worn swords on their back because they were already wearing something else on their back already, beforehand. Yeah, that's right. Shields, all right? And before two-handed swords came in, okay, one-handed swords, you're basically considered underarmed if you're going to battle and you didn't have a shield. Shield was like one of the most primary and common, uh, you know, things that you carried into warfare. You'd have an axe, you'd have a spear, or something like that, but a shield is almost a necessity in so many types of warfare, not just in the early medieval period, in the medieval, high medieval period. Look at warfare from earlier periods, like a classical period. Shields are everywhere. And when you're traveling, even over long distances and short, one of the uh, classic ways, to wear a shield on your back just with a strap like this all right now if i already have this in place could i fit a sword on my back yes i could it would be more awkward i have to take my shield off i'd have to put the sword on and the shield back on and so that creates more barriers to getting that done when there's an easier solution just wear the sword on the side in fact i feel it's out of place i'm wearing a long sword with a shield one-handed sword. Yeah, that's a bit better. And so one-handed swords are actually far more common than two-handed swords, okay? Even in the times when two-handed swords were used, one-handed swords were still hugely prevalent, all right? In actual fact, long swords represent a minority of sword use in the historical picture than one hand, by far than one-handed swords, okay? And one of the advantages of one-handed swords is uh, you got a free hand. What are you going to do with it? So I actually have methods of just swing it up. <laughs> that was actually pretty easy. <laughs> it was the first time I tried that. But grab it and, I'm re and you're ready to go. And by the way, having the strap around your neck while you're holding your shield, very common historically. Look at all these artworks, okay? Uh, and the ones I found more often are actually representative of uh, kite shields and heater shields. But yeah, all right? Having it strapped, you know, doing all your, what you need to do. And then once you're done, well, you can just, uh, and you're ready to walk around. So that, I think, is a big reason why the beginning, the, the uh, initial birth of wearing swords, oh, well, the initial birth happened before the medieval period, but seriously, if you're wearing a shield, very unlikely you would wear a sword also. So Link, sorry mate, when you're doing the double thing, maybe I'll explore a way to do the double thing. But again, we come back to that idea about necessity being the mother of invention. I'm confident that there is a way to make wearing a shield, okay, on your back and having a sword there will work. But why would I need to try and figure that out when this works fine? There are advantages and disadvantages, but there's adventures here. The cloak thing is a big one. And so because I might lose some of the adventures to gain arguably equivalent different advantages for the back, and I actually think it's a far equivalent trade-off. Why would I bother when getting similar amount of advantages versus, versus disadvantages requires more work, ingenuity, thinking, when I don't even need to waste the time? Big reason, I think. Now, out of practicality and function, this would have remained the norm for a very long period. So if you, I, I always mention again and again, I don't, it's hard for me to acknowledge medieval as uh, before the year 1000, uh, because, uh, for me, I so iconically identify castles, knights with the medieval period, and uh, you don't really see them before then. So maybe, could you call it the Dark Ages? Uh, no, I don't like Dark Ages either. But anyway, so looking at 500 to the 1000, shields all the way through. And then in the high medieval period, the period that I really identify as the medieval period, from the year 1000 all the way through to 1300s, 1400s, shields are still around, okay? Um, and even in the situations where you take off the shield, suddenly you have tradition, fashion ingrained in the society so strongly, why would you really need to try and think around the issue of, to get the sword on your back? Especially when some of the advantages of getting a sword on your back can be done in an alternative way of side carrying, and this 
is a historical thing, okay? This is really interesting, because I remember, if you're wading through bogs or you just need it off the ground, so it might not clatter when you need to crawl or something like that, or if you're climbing, there is a method to, to do that, but still have it on the side. Let me show you. Yep, that is the baldric. Baldric, a belt slung over your shoulder. Now, people might think, how oh, well, the baldric is some, generally what I've found is more classically identified with uh, Renaissance rapiers can more classically be displayed by being hung on a baldric. But no, baldrics were used very much in the medieval period. Look at these artistic resources. These are some of the resources I found in all my you know, searching and searching and searching because I wondered that uh, if a sword is on your back, generally it's going to be attached through a baldric. It's going to be on your back. And so if I search keyword baldric, I might actually find someone who looks, saw a strap and it might be on the back. There's an interesting point of reference to try and search for perhaps. But what I did find was, of course, swords worn th with a baldric. Okay. Now, what I find really interesting about is like, why? Why would you wear a sword on a baldric over on your belt? Well, uh, comfort, again, um, if you prefer the weight distributed on your shoulder than on the hip, that's one. Now, in terms of how attached, it, it, it'll fly, flip around even more so than the more secure belt attachments. So, why do it? Well, what if you wanted to do this to get the sword out of the way and off the ground? I think that's, uh, and you just hold it with one hand, you know, it wouldn't stay there permanently unless you hooked the belt onto something. But look at that. You have a, oh, by the way, if you're wondering, I have a different scabbers and so I didn't want to have to like take off all the belts and everything. And so I attach it to one of my LARP scabbers. And yeah, there is a scabbard made for this LARP sword, both by Kalamasil, great, great brand, by the way. This is the Kalamasil Witcher Sword. And so I wonder if I can uh, do Nate's method. I need to swing it. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, can't do it, mate. Not like that. But um, anyway, it is actually a really, really cool thing. And uh, it actually looks pretty cool. A really cool, detailed scabbard. So you wouldn't do it to draw the sword on your back. But if you're wading through water and marshes, trying to get the sword out of the way, hike it up like that. And then once you're ready, back down. And then you can draw it ready to be used. And yeah, quick shout out to Kalamasil. This isn't sponsored by the way, but uh, I, bought, I bought these with my own money because really good quality. Just really good quality LARP swords. Made a video on them, so yeah. But I do have an affiliate link from the other video I made on them, so I'll just chuck that down if you're interested. Anyway, baldrics, there we go. Swords worn on the side on a baldric, and when you are in that situation where you need some of the advantages of wearing a sword on your back, it can convert to a back scabbard instantly. Do I know if that's what they've done historically? We know baldrics are worn, but do I know if they did it with the, the baldric? No idea, all right? I still have not found any, you know, depiction of, uh, you know, that. And what would be interesting is that this would confirm it. If we found a sword on the back, it's like, oh, they wore swords on the back for a medieval period. But if the sword was hanging you know, in a different angle to the thing. Maybe it was, maybe it was Nate's method, right? Um, but uh, that's an interesting result of hiking a, uh, a baldric up to be on the back. So now out of all my searching, guess what I did find? I actually did find, is this, is am I contradicting myself? Hear me out. I did find an image of a sword being worn on the back but not high on the back, not the classic, you know, fantasy thing. But this is absolute evidence that swords were sworn on the back in the medieval period. That's what I'm saying, okay? I, we, we, we have references of, you know, things outside the medieval period, but have a look at this picture, all right? How, it, that's is interesting. So I've duplicated it here, and what you have is uh, two loops, okay, okay? One loop attaching the belt, and then a connection point, and then a wider loop that hangs over your neck. And so this seems to be the method, just like that. And uh, why do they prefer it? Where they might prefer the weight? I mean, it's around the neck, but of course there are other ways to you know, prevent that and things. But this legitimately looks to be the way. And people could say, Shad, this is actually a method of wearing a sword on your side, having the baldric loop down to get, you know, it's, it's not really more stable, all right? And in this picture, they just depicted it on the back like that. And I get that, of course, as probably is the case. But it seems to be that they are from this picture and we can explore to try and figure out the advantages of wearing a sword like this. So it's out of the way of your hands. You know, there's no, nothing sticking out. I mean, I've met 
previous video where I explore the bow, how it can be adapted into fantasy, I do mention that two-handed swords hanging out like that get in the way and you have to swing it around and stuff. And so if I had a belt that I was wanting to wear on my side, but I needed it out of the way from the front part, this type of method where I had a baldric like this, all right, now I need to use my bow. Time to get this sword out of the way so I can do it. Well, there. Uh, sliding this along the belt, the belt is so tight, it's actually really difficult, it takes time, you have to like, d d d to get it back behind. This is quick and easy, bang, now it's out of the way, I can do what I want, and then perhaps I put it back. Or this image could be that the guy wore it like this all the time, we don't know. Possible, all right, and he has the sword there, because the sword can be grabbed just as easy, like just like that, and so, you know, if you're wanting to Hands up this, like this, but if you want to grab the sword ready to use, just there, there, I'm good. And then putting it away just as easy, and then hanging just like that. But this, this is a historical method, it's on artwork. That is my very detailed look at back scabbards once again. Uh, the pros and cons, and of course reasons why we see it far less in the medieval period, specifically. Because there is evidence of it happy, of swords being worn on the back outside, as we mentioned and gone over. And I've put on my regular back scabbard now because there is one last thing that I do want to mention, which I probably could have put earlier on to make it more, flow more easily, but hey, you say what you can when it comes to your mind. Um, is that uh, back scabbard like this, less like in the medieval period because it requires a custom scabbard. We are only calling it custom now because it's unconventional to the norm. If this was the norm, a regular scabbard that's connected all the way up on each side would be considered custom, okay? With how elaborate some of the scabbards were in the medieval period, especially with specific, you know, rigging mechanisms. Because there is artwork showing swords hung from belts just through a loop, sometimes through the belt itself. Oh, that was my other reason. Maybe I'll say it now where I'm at. Because, yeah, there are scabbards made with their own separate belt, but say you didn't want to make a, a, like a dedicated belt to wear your sword, you're generally already wearing a belt. And so you can avoid the extra work and wearing a sword on your back, that will always usually require an additional belt from the one that you're probably already wearing, even if it's just a cord of rope. We see cords of rope, lots in the medieval period, just around the waist. Uh, and so save your time and money in making its own dedicated belt hanging thing. You can just uh, loop it through your belt like that. You know, that there is probably the most intuitive and logical reason why swords have always been more commonly worn on the hip than on your back. Because you already have a belt around your waist and it's the most easiest convenient thing to just slip it through the belt that exists there and then it's hung there and that can create the tradition and the idea, the fashion that this is where swords belong and that is out of the way. So that is actually one of the bigger reasons combined with shields, that warfare for the larger portion of the medieval period involved shields and best place to carry shields on the back, combined with cloaks, okay, cloak will go over the sword already. Those are three big reasons, sword through the belt, cloak and shields, why the first idea of where to wear your sword is gonna be at your side. Then there are more elaborate ways to wear a belt. And we have seen historically that belts oftentimes had their own belt that they hung from separate to your waist belt. Now, to me, that takes as much additional work and fiddling than making something like this. Like if you were doing it, you wouldn't make an additional scabbard. That would be the main scabbard. And to make a scabbard like this, I don't see it any, any more work than making a regular decent scabbard, just like that. Uh, you just make something like this, and then because you, the, the belt that you have it attached to, no more work to make a belt like that as the belt that, you know, this is going to hang by. And so the idea that back scabbards weren't done because they take additional work doesn't, doesn't fly. It doesn't make sense because normal side-worn scabbards often took a lot of work, especially the fancy ones, just as much work as that. And so these ideas I have just found really interesting personally, and I wanted to share them with you. And having said all this, I really do feel the back scabbard absolutely can fit in a fantasy setting logically and functionally, and can work brilliantly well, all right? <laughs> Sorry, I just like showing it because <laughs> it's really cool, okay? And I do like the look, all right? Now we have a different aesthetic, different fashion idea that this looks utilitarian. It looks, you know, heroic and things where it's just like, By the power of Grayskull, I have 
Uh, by the way, he man, he doesn't have a proper scabbard, but the, the, the power, sword of power, it's very short, so maybe, I don't know. And in a medieval setting, even sticking with some of the iconic medieval look, you can impose a different, you know, fashion mindset on it. A different aesthetic, an aesthetic that is more appealing to a modern audience, and mix it up a bit, and I think because of that, that's where the necessity came in. That's where me and a lot of people was like, all right, we like the look. Can you do it? And after I've done it, I found very legitimate functional benefits to it, okay? And it's interesting weighing up the pros and cons. So absolutely keep it in fantasy. I think it's great fun. And depending on your preferences, I personally think it looks very cool. And so thank you for watching, guys. This is one of my favorite subjects, as you can see. And hopefully I'll be able to make more videos on it in the future. Hope you've enjoyed. Hope to see you again as well. So until then, farewell.